For this review, we're going to try something a bit different. I'm going to organize my review into three sections depending on where you might be in the Pokemon fan scale. So there's going to be a section for people who love Pokemon, people who are indifferent to Pokemon, and people who are critical of Pokemon. I won't be changing my opinions for these sections, but I will be presenting different types of information based on what I think you would be interested in. This is a little bit experimental. If it happens to go over really well, I might do more of these in the future, and if it doesn't, then this will be a one-off thing. Regardless, we're going to get started by talking to you Pokemon fans. As you're probably well aware by now, the game is split into three sections. You've got gym battles, each with their own pre-battle gimmick or mini-game. Beating these lets you control higher level Pokemon as usual. Legendary Pokemon hunts against rare variants or giant Pokemon. Beating these unlock more ride options for your ride Pokemon, such as being able to swim or glide. This basically takes over for the HM moves in previous games. And finally, Horde battles against members of the new Team Rocket stand-in, Team Star, where you'll fight multiple Pokemon at once and eventually a boss. This unlocks more TMs in the item store. You've probably also heard that the game is open world, and that is true for the most part. There are some events that are locked off by needing better ride abilities, so personally I would recommend prioritizing the legendary hunts, which you'll probably want to do anyway so that your ride Pokemon is as useful as possible, as early as possible. To explain the world map a little bit, areas are sectioned off by direction from the middle of the map and given a number based on how strong the Pokemon and objectives are in that area. For example, in the beginning of the game, it'll ask you to either go east or west. Regardless of which direction you pick, you'll start in area 1 with the weakest Pokemon and work your way up but you're always free to go back and go the other direction. If you make it to West Area 3, then you can expect East Area 3 to be about the same Pokemon level-wise. Encounters don't scale, so the ideal play order would be to work each area of the map somewhat evenly. If you don't, you'll make some areas harder on yourself than necessary, and other areas will become a joke if you're overleveled. The game keeps track of what order you tackle objectives in, so everyone's completed maps will look a little bit different, which is a cute touch. The ability to fly is unlocked right from the beginning of the game too, so things are a little bit easier to navigate. Interestingly enough, they don't even really explain why you have fly at the beginning of the game, and there's not a whole lot of ceremony around it. You just choose a Pokemon Center that you've already been to, hit the fly button, and then you teleport immediately to that space. The best you'll get if you want context is a little picture of a bunch of bird Pokemon carrying a taxi. If you're a Pokemon collector, this might be the most available Pokemon I've ever seen be available at once. By the time I was finished with the first gym battle of the game, I already had over 50 Pokemon in my collection. In fact, there are so many Pokemon available, I had to actively stop myself from catching new Pokemon so that I could actually finish the game in time to get this review done. One question a ton of people have had is, how is the legendary writing Pokemon going to be handled? Because obviously they can't give you a legendary right from the beginning of the game, but since it's so integral to the way that you get around now, you're going to need to get it pretty early on and I am happy to tell you that you will be getting the ride Pokemon almost immediately, but their excuse for you not having a legendary Pokemon in your party is that this form of the legendary Pokemon isn't built for battle. At some point down the line, you'll have to complete some conditions to actually turn it into a fighting Pokemon. At the moment, it's basically just like a bicycle. The co-op in this game is surprisingly well implemented, and I think it's going to offer hours and hours of gameplay to people who are interested. I wouldn't say that the game does anything particularly new, but I do think going around and hunting rare Pokemon and finding rare items with your friends is going to be a really good time. I am hoping that Game Freak keeps up the support and offers some events and special raid bosses down the line, to keep people coming back and playing the multiplayer for at least the next few months. Meh. Alright, the game is fun, but the pacing is a problem. 
The lack of level scaling means you will want to constantly switch paths, otherwise areas will become so easy they will seem more like a hassle than a challenge. If you've made it to area 4 on the east path, then are you really going to want to work your way through areas 1 through 3 on the west path? It's a bit of a problem. The game tries to address how easy the past gym battles in other Pokemon games have been by giving the gym leaders slightly better move coverage. So when you roll up on the fighting gym with your Psychic and Ghost-type Pokemon, don't be thrown off when their Fighting-type Pokemon know some Dark-type moves to counter your strategy. But if we're being real with each other, you can still cheese the game with one very powerful Pokemon, Personally, I was able to get through just about all of the late game stuff with one Azumarill that was about 10 levels higher than all of my opponent's Pokemon. The game's new gimmick, Terastalizing, is a fairly interesting mechanic. You can use it to change a Pokemon's type to a new type, or make a Pokemon monotype so it loses the weaknesses of one of its existing types. For example, if you have a Fire Ghost Pokemon, you can terastalize it into being Mono Fire so you lose the weaknesses that come with being Ghost types. Theoretically, I think this is going to get a little bit silly, and some typings will definitely need to be looked at for Smogon style battles. For example, if you have a strong normal type wall like Chansey terastalizing into a Ghost type to make it immune to fighting types, that could be a little bit too strong for the metagame. On the other hand, though, it would then have the same weaknesses as a Ghost-type Pokémon, which could make it a bit easier to defeat, so what do I know? As far as the gym leaders and team bosses go, this might actually be my favorite overall showing. In fact, this game contains my favorite gym leader in any Pokémon game so far. I won't spoil who it is or why I like them, but I will say it's the normal-type gym leader. Some love and detail has been put into the leaders to give them a ton of personality, their dialogue is normally pretty refreshing, and the way that they're animated gives them a lot of character. One example is when you go and fight the VTuber gym leader that everybody is abuzz about, you will actually see their avatar in the corner of your screen moving and talking just like the VTubers on your favorite YouTube channels. If I'm being really honest, I hated her, but if you're somebody who's into that VTuber lifestyle, then you're probably going to get a kick out of what they've done with her. I want to clear the record a little bit on the way this game is actually set up. To be clear, the quote-unquote freedom given by the objectives is a little bit oversold. In fact, it's an outright lie, if I'm being completely honest. What they're trying to sell you is that there's a ton more content to do now that there are 18 objectives to go after instead of just the 8 gym battles. But in reality, it's the same amount of content that you've gotten in every other Pokemon game. What they've actually done is split up the story content so that you can do it in whatever order and whenever you want. To put it in Pokemon Gen 1 terms, think back to waking up Snorlax, fighting the Marowak ghost, and finding Mewtwo in the final cave. If this were Scarlet and Violet, each of those three would be considered an objective and given a spot on the map along with its own badge. So don't let the game fool you into thinking there's a ton more content. It's the same amount of content, just with the freedom to choose when you do these actual events and not leading you down a linear story path. It's the equivalent of putting a few more cuts in a pizza and trying to tell you there's more slices of pizza to go around, if you know what I mean. Not that I don't appreciate the freedom to do the story events in whatever order you want, or just outright ignore ones that you're not interested in until the end of the game. The trainer battles are optional now, which is a good change. Trainers you can battle now have a special speech bubble above their heads, and a battle will not commence until you talk to them first. While totally optional, you'll get rewards at Pokemon Centers if you take the time to find and battle these trainers. The experience is also much higher than fighting random battles, so at some point you'll want to pick a few fights. In fact, I would recommend doing this as early as possible, because if you wait until too late into the game, these trainer battles are going to be quite trivial, and you're not going to benefit as much from the heightened experience. Once you reach the credits, there's a completely new set of things to do. 
there's actually a surprising amount of story content after the credits have rolled. In fact, this might be the biggest post-game we've had since the original DS titles. I really don't want to spoil any of the post-game stuff you'll get to do, but one of the things you'll get to do is actually redo all eight of the gyms, but this time on hard mode with much, much better Pokémon. And your reward for doing this is actually a bit more story content with your favorite gym leaders. Before we start this section, I want to let you know that there are going to be some pretty major spoilers, so if you don't want the game spoiled, I recommend skipping over this section. The game runs like crap. Some of the graphical glitches and performance issues are actually unacceptable. In cutscenes, for example, some background characters will be moving at 10 frames a second. It's very noticeable, especially in handheld mode. Graphically, this game may actually be a couple of steps down from Sword and Shield. It seems to be running the exact same engine as Sword and Shield, but because of the open world being rendered at all times, performance suffers which makes it look way worse. I can't even imagine what this game looks like when you are playing in co-op. On the bright side, some of the Pokémon have been retextured to look a bit more like realistic animals, so that's a plus. The way the story presents itself is awful. In all three stories, might I add. In this region, being the Pokémon Champion is actually just a title that lots of people have. There is a character called the Top Champion, but you'll never be able to get that title yourself. Once you become a champion, you'll just be one of many other champions in the region. The legendary Pokémon Hunt is framed around a character collecting seasonings to make sandwiches. It feels like the dumbest possible excuse you could have for hunting down legendary Pokémon. They do explain it a bit better down the line, but it feels like a colossal waste of time when you start doing it. The new team is pathetic. They haven't even done anything. We've gone from teams stealing and abusing Pokémon to trying to flood the Earth to a group of kids whose biggest crime is ditching school a few days. This is extra dumb when you realize that your main character never even has to go to school and gets hailed as a model student. Not only does the Team Star concept make no sense, but it's by far the weakest of the three main storylines. The person who asks you to take Team Star down is named Cassiopeia. You know, like the star. And after each boss you beat, Cassiopeia talks longingly about the boss in a way that only someone who knows the bosses personally would talk. On top of that, a small, shy, mysterious girl appears afterwards to give you a reward. I I'm sorry, but if you can't figure out where that story is going, I don't think I can help you. The gym fights are actually the worst I've seen in a while from the series. Each one makes you play a mini-game or has a gimmick that ranges from being almost kind of okay to actually being horrible. One of them is pushing around a giant olive-shaped ball, and the physics do not work. At all. One of them is traveling halfway across the map for seemingly no reason. The only somewhat nice thing about these gimmicks is that they're mercifully short. You can be in a town and out with a gym badge in less than five minutes. Despite how much I like the designs of the bosses, the actual fights are pretty pathetic. At first, I was interested to see how terrestrializing would change the mechanics. The answer is, they make the fights even easier than usual. With a mechanic like terrestrializing, you have the potential to create some really cool fights. For example, if you fight the water gym and you're crushing it with a grass-type Pokémon, you would expect that maybe the gym leader could change their strongest Pokémon to a new type so your grass strategy is less effective. This would make you actually think about things like move coverage and having multiple Pokémon you can use to tackle a gym, rather than having one Pokémon who can solo the entire thing. It would also just be kind of cool to see Pokémon who are usually one type turn into a completely new type. But nope! The gym leader will always terrestrialize into the same type their Pokémon is already using. You may argue that this makes sense thematically, but from a gameplay standpoint it means that you just have to mash the exact same move you were already using to defeat their other Pokémon. Hmm. 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 
The game can be really fun, but they wasted a lot of their best concepts, unfortunately. I think Pokemon fans are going to really enjoy this game, and with everything there is to do in multiplayer, I think Pokemon fans will be enjoying this for the next four months at the least. Personally speaking, I still think Arceus is the best Pokemon game on the Switch, but I also realize I'm looking for different things in a Pokemon game. What I'm looking for are fresh experiences, and what Pokemon fans are generally looking for are comfy familiar ones. There's nothing wrong with that. This is a huge step in the right direction, but it's frustrating that Game Freak couldn't fully commit to the open world idea with scaling Pokemon and giving us really boring gym fights. The story starts out extremely slow, but then ramps up into being, eh, pretty okay. One moment near the end may have even brought a small tear to my eye. If you were put off a bit by Pokemon Sword and Shield, I think this is the game that will redeem the series for you. If you haven't been impressed with the series over this last decade, I don't think this will change your mind significantly, but could still be a good time if you've got some buddies to play with. Do I like this game? Yes. Did this game exceed my expectations? Yes. Would I consider it a must-play game in the genre? Um, this is where things get messy. I'm really stuck somewhere between 6 and 7 on this one. But my general rule of thumb is if I'm stuck between two numbers, I default to the lower one on most occasions, and I'm gonna have to do the same here. If this game receives some decent DLC or support with events and new content, this could well be a 7 very soon.